Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. My guest on today's show is Gordon Barnes. Gordon is the Executive Vice President and the Head of Portfolio Group at Bain Capital's Partnership Strategies Team, a group that manages assets primarily for Bain Capital partners in strategies that diversify away from the equity orientation of the firm's core. Colin Campbell, the group's co-head, was a previous guest on Capital Allocators, and that conversation is replayed in the feed for context on the group's approach to investing in esoteric assets. Prior to Bain Capital, Gordon was a managing director and global head of operational due diligence at Cambridge Associates, where he helped build the firm's ODD practice. Our time together covers Gordon's perspective on ODD from his time at Cambridge, how to do a deep dive and be knowledgeable on uncommon fund strategies, some case studies from his work with managers, and what makes his role one of a kind in helping managers build a fund business that is operationally ready for institutional capital. Please enjoy my conversation with Gordon Barnes. Gordon, thanks for joining me today. Scott, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. It's really exciting to be on the show. Tell us about the background and your career path. Sure. Well, I started out after undergrad. I went right into fund accounting, which was a great entry into the industry, you know, learning how to strike an NAV. I did that both in the traditional asset management space, and then I moved into the hedge fund side. That was my entry into the hedge fund industry where I got exposure to different strategies, you know, understood the mechanics of fund accounting, what goes into an NAV, understanding the instruments that hedge funds trade, the different uh, counterparties involved. And that was a really good baseline and backdrop in order to move into my next role, which was at a small local hedge fund of funds, where my role was kind of the jack of all trades. My main role was on the fund accounting side to make sure on an ongoing basis that we were, you know, reporting the right numbers, performance reporting, keeping the the marketing materials updated. And in addition to that, I started doing operational due diligence. And this was in the 2003 to 2005 timeframe, pre-made off. This operational due diligence didn't really exist as a role at the time. It wasn't formalized. And kudos to the fund of funds that I worked for, for having the insight to say, hey, we need some expertise to evaluate this part of hedge fund businesses. You know, they had the expertise on the investment side, but they needed somebody to come in and help evaluate the mechanics of the back office at these firms that they're investing in, and many of which were boutique managers. So less than 500 million less than 10 people for the most part. So there really wasn't a substantial back office with these firms. And it was really important to go in and understand if they had the right people and processes and systems in place to provide us with the reporting that we need and the accuracy of numbers and and also mitigate risk on the business and operational side. And how did people respond to that early intervention on that front? Maybe I'll just take it to the next role and I'll I'll tackle that question. I spent a few years at that firm and that led me to Cambridge Associates, which I joined at the inception of the formation of Operation Due Diligence team at Cambridge. And in order to manage client portfolios, the firm utilizes primarily external managers with a somewhat heavier allocation or focus on alternative investments. I started within the hedge fund team to help create and build out an operational due diligence program. To answer your question, at the beginning of that process, we were coming in with established hedge fund relationships, 
And we started asking questions about, hey, can we get a meeting with your CFO, or your COO? And they kind of looked at us oddly and said, why do you want to meet with our CFO? What, what could you possibly want to ask them? No one's ever requested this. And that was a very common theme across many of the managers. They questioned, well, why, why do you need to do this? Do you not trust us? Is there something that you're looking for? And granted, that's an excusable reaction, right? There was a long-term relationship that was in place, and we had this new team banging on their door to come in and, and learn more about how they operate. But over time, you know, we educated them on you know, what we're trying to do. We're not there to play gotcha. We're not there to call them out. We're really there to learn about how they operate. And as a fiduciary, it's our duty to understand these types of things and highlight where there may be risk in order to steer our clients in the right direction. I was at Cambridge for almost 14 years, which was a, a great experience. It gave me great exposure. We started with ODD, as I mentioned, in the hedge fund space. And then over time, we built out the process across all asset classes, so including private strategies, and then also on the traditional asset management side. We also built out the team globally. We had people on the ground in London and in Singapore. We thought it was very important to have people on the ground in the same time zone as managers in those areas and having that network you know, with the service providers, being able to you know, visit on-site locally, understanding the regulatory environment in those jurisdictions was important. And also being a utility in those office locations because many of the client-facing people that, you know, they were there and able to answer questions or, you know, meet with those clients and be more of an advisory utility to the client portfolio managers on the ground. When you are in those far-flung destinations, does the framework change? You know, a lot of the framework is the same. There's just slightly different things and, and they all get to the right answer. I don't know if this is still the case, but a lot of managers in Asia embraced outsourcing a lot more than managers in the U.S. I think that since has changed in the U.S. where outsourcing is no longer a bad word and there's lots of great choices out there from an outsourcing standpoint. But I, I think Asia was more, many managers there were early adopters to outsourcing, whether it be, you know, middle or back office type functions or, you know, IT or compliance related functions. So you did that for a long time and then made the move to Bain. What prompted that move? Yeah. So at Cambridge, I got to see lots of investment managers got to look under the hood across various different strategies. And over time, I, I, there was a few things that I really liked. Number one was getting involved with newer launched managers. Cambridge did invest with established managers. And then also occasionally they'd be involved with managers from day one. So that would typically be a spin out from a firm that they knew or had invested with. And it was a, a team that they were familiar with. And I really enjoyed working with those firms from an operational due diligence standpoint, because there was some additional tangible impact and value that could be brought to the table as they prepared for the launch of the fund. For example, I could uh, be a resource on service provider selection systems. We wouldn't necessarily recommend certain service providers, but we'd point people in the right direction of, hey, maybe you should take a look based on your strategy, you should take a look at these three administrators and pick the one that you think is best match for your specific needs and, and the role that you want them to play. So that was one of the you know things that I got interested in. The other area that I enjoyed, as you know, I, as I mentioned, I got to see lots of different strategies over time. So lots of you know long short equity funds and, and sort of the mainstream alternative strategies. And there were certain strategies that Cambridge looked at that they were different. It was a little bit more challenging than the typical mainstream strategies, where it was very cookie cutter the approach that they could take to set up the operations. And with other kind of less mainstream strategies, there was more work and creativity that needed to be placed to set up the operation. 
So one example that comes to mind is at one point we looked at a rail car leasing fund, a fund that would go out and buy fleets of rail cars and then lease them out. And just learning about how the asset worked and how that particular space worked was really fascinating. And there was lots of you know, interesting areas to dive into during that project. Tell me about the group that you work in. The name of the group is called Bain Capital Partnership Strategies. It's one of about a dozen different business units here at Bain Capital. It's on the smaller side and newer side. The group has been in existence for over a decade, but commercialized in 2018. And its main focus is searching for niche, attractive, uncorrelated investments, both direct and through partnering with external investment managers. And does that cover liquid and illiquid, or is it focused in one area? It's focused on strategies on the more liquid side, but we do have some leeway to go into more illiquid strategies. So then you move over to more of a strategic advisory role at Bain. How is that different from what you were doing at Cambridge? It's related, what I just described with regards to working with you know, newer launch managers and more esoteric strategies. That's essentially what I do here. The advisory that I did at Cambridge was a little bit more higher level. I didn't really have the capacity and time to really take a deep dive in with them where you know, here I have that capacity and capability to be able to do that. What's really transferable is kind of all of the knowledge that I aggregated across all of those reps of manager reviews. And it's not only the manager operations due diligence reviews that I was personally involved with as a team in order to kind of give each other a lot more exposure. We'd share a lot of the findings that we had from the respective due diligence reviews that we did. And we, if there were certain issues that came up, we'd sit down as a, you know, on a weekly team meeting and talk through it. You see lots of different ways of how managers do things well. There's multiple paths that you can take to get to the same right answer. And there's also things that people didn't do well that you, you make note of over time. I got lots of exposure to different industry service providers, got to know who is good at what and where certain firms' strengths and weaknesses are. And all of that knowledge is very transferable to my current role. And with your focus on these esoteric strategies, I'd love to hear some examples of what that might be. And a question that comes to mind is just how how much research do you have to do on this stuff to really get a sense of what it is, since it's not just a right down the middle, long, short equity fund? The types of strategies, like I said, they're, they're niche, they're less competed areas of certain markets. Some examples are music royalties, right? So that's an area that we've done a lot of work on. Environmental and the carbon markets, that's another area. Crypto is an area that we've done a lot of work on. Electricity and power trading is another great example. Part of my role is still, you know, ensuring that the risk is mitigated from an operations standpoint and there's you know, appropriate procedures and controls in place. You need to know how this strategy works from the standpoint of the instruments that are involved, who are the key counterparties, who are the players in the industry, how do transactions actually work in this particular industry to understand where the potential risks are and how to best structure the strategy. So th there's also a lot of research on the service provider side. As you can imagine, it's very easy to find service providers, a fund administrator, an auditor, or an order management system that can handle a long short equity fund. But doing that for these types of strategies is very difficult because there's very few or if any service providers that might have that particular experience. So it, you might have to come at it from a different angle and say, for example, okay, well, who has at least royalty experience? You know, maybe they don't have music royalty, but they understand farmer royalties or other types of royalties and how to account for those things. So a lot of my job is really getting up to speed on how the strategy works. And that includes I do a lot of my own research, but I sit in on some of the investment due diligence meetings, the investment strategy meetings with the, the investment teams that we're looking at, 
as they walk us through the strategy so I can get educated on how the strategy works. And when you're dealing with this group of managers, what's the benchmark of sizing and tenure and track record? I'd love to hear more about what is critical mass for somebody that would hit your radar to kind of get Gordon involved in the process? A lot of the managers that we're looking at are pre-launch. It's a team or it may even be one individual that has expertise in a certain industry or has you know, experience with running a strategy in an esoteric market where they have deep expertise and edge to be able to you know, exploit a certain inefficiency in that particular market. And we think that it's scale one up to warrant our attention. So, you know, hard to put numbers around that. But from a staff standpoint, it's very small. And in many cases, it starts with one individual or two individuals that are either spinning out of an, another organization or, you know, maybe they've been managing a strategy with proprietary capital and there's capacity to raise additional money with a you know strategic partner. So this is really early stage stuff, what we're talking about here. Again, we, we do do some direct investments, but many of the investments are with you know, external partners who you know, run these strategies and we help them build and grow their firms. Many of them are early stage, but there are circumstances where we find an established manager that maybe has a multi-strategy approach and we like a certain aspect of you know certain sub strategy and we package that in a fund of one to access exposure to that particular you know niche strategy how much is culture part of that assessment at that early point in the life cycle yeah i mean i think alignment and culture is a key piece and that's probably even before i get involved with the process i'm not on the you know, at the top of the funnel on the sourcing side, I kind of get involved where a lot of that diligence has been done. There's been, you know, a lot of validation. There started to be some reference checking and the team thinks that it's it's going to be a good opportunity. When I get involved, the process may include some other checks like, you know, your typical background checks on the team. And you take that together with all the other diligence that's been done on the people side, right? So there's, you know, a collective mosaic of, you know, reference checks and background checks and then all the the in person interactions that you have with the team to help develop that view on is this a team that we want to work with and, and do they have the right culture? And other background checks, how deep down the bench do you go? If it's an existing manager, you generally want to do background checks on owners of the firm the key risk takers on the investment side. So that's generally like the portfolio manager, the co-portfolio managers. In some cases, there may be you know strategy silos where you want to run checks on those individuals. And then on the non-investment side, it's typically, number one, the person that has ultimate oversight of cash accounts. And then there's you know a senior level chief operating officer or somebody that sits beside the CFO. It depends on the structure of the firm, but Those are the key concepts that really drive who you're going to run the background check. And then it's also, there's a reason that you believe, you know, there may be cases where during the reference checks, somebody says, I heard something about this, that, or another individual that you might want to run a check to dig into that a little bit deeper if, if that's necessary. It's really a combination of your standard versus bespoke. There may be ad hoc checks done. And on the on the new launch side, at the time of our checks, we're really dealing with the founding, you know, partner or partners of the firm. And then later on down the road, if during the launch process they hire a CFO will we'll run checks as part of that process. What are the hot buttons for Bain on that on that front? A lot of it's a validation of trust, right? So assuming that there isn't any kind of major red flags on that side of things. That's clearly an issue. Most of the time, it's not, you know, XYZ person is a convicted felon. It's not that easy. There's little tidbits of information that may be helpful as part of, you know, the overall process. And and a lot of times you can't take the background check in a silo. You have to kind of combine it with 
the other areas of the due diligence process to kind of create that mosaic. So it's it's a combination of the reference checks, the background check, the in-person interactions that you have, and that creates that mosaic. Over the course of, of my career, there's been some circumstances where a manager knew that we were running background checks and they didn't disclose something up front. And, you know, the fact that they could have brought that up to us in advance is kind of a negative data point where they should have brought that to our attention at the beginning. And do you have any specifics on that? One example, this wasn't necessarily background check related, but it was definitely a trust related issue. So this was many years ago where there was an instance where we had a manager and during the pre-meeting review, we highlighted that a few people on the team mentioned that they worked at a European investment bank. They didn't name the specific firm. And it was just odd that they listed all the firms in their background, but they listed this one firm. And so that was one of the things we wrote down to address with the team. And actually, we had done some research and we found that this particular firm that they didn't list the CEO was involved with a fraud and, you know, it subsequently went out of business. So we brought it up with a team. We said, you know, what's this firm that several of you used to work at? And they gave us the name of the firm and they just kind of moved on. And what that said to us was they had the opportunity at that point to give us the story behind what actually happened there. We couldn't find any linkage to these specific individuals with this particular fraud. You know, the only person that was actually charged was the CEO and the CFO, and then they weren't named in any of these things. They probably just didn't want to be associated with the name of this firm. But the fact that they avoided that and didn't bring it out to us was not a great data point and kind of breached trust a little bit because they had, you know, they had the opportunity to address that. They passed it over during the meeting. So it just makes you question of what other things could they be downplaying or not providing the full story on. So you've mentioned you're working with pre-launch managers, and we have a sense of your operational assessment. What's the to-do list for this pre-launch manager? First and foremost, I think you need to start out with a plan. And you know, one of the things that I noticed with a lot of these new launches is that they may not have a formal business plan, and it could take any form. It doesn't have to be certain template, but it's a good practice to sit down and at least start that process to put a blueprint for here's what my firm's going to look like, both from a strategy standpoint, and here's what my needs are from a technology and a staffing standpoint, and here's what my firm might look like in one, three, and five years out. Because that is really helpful, especially for me, if the team has certain strategies or you know, assets or instruments in mind that they want to expand into in you know, 12 or 18 months, that's going to impact a lot of the decisions that you make when you select service providers or systems or things like that. So getting those things down on paper is, is very helpful. And that's also for when you're onboarding certain service providers or counterparties, they want to understand about, okay, well, what's your strategy? And again, like a lot of these strategies, they're very unique or things that many people haven't seen before. So being able to describe that in a succinct way, is very helpful for when you're dealing with service providers and onboarding counterparties. The other key tool is kind of the launch plan, right? There are certain things that every hedge fund launch needs, you know, and, and it may even just be, you know, human resource needs or insurance needs. And the core service providers, the fund administrator, the auditor. Then there's certain things based on my research of the the industry and the strategy that you know also go into that that launch plan and creating you know a project plan. And I like to see it in a Gantt chart form to kind of look at okay, here's the various tasks I need to complete between now and and launch, and here's the things that need to be done across all the different verticals, not only to kind of make sure you're keeping on track, but just to visualize it. That's the central planning piece that I keep in touch with managers on an ongoing basis. So there's generally a weekly call 
or a biweekly call to walk through progress in those areas where, you know, certain areas that are running behind or where they're, they're ahead, because there's lots of things that need to happen and they all need to come together in order to launch. Some people don't like checklists, but this is one instance where a checklist is very important because you don't want to miss uh, something and it could throw your plans off. And how critical is it at this juncture to make that first non-investment hire? Generally, getting the right CFO in the door is probably one of the most important decisions the founding partners can make if that particular individual isn't part of the founding team, because they're going to provide a lot of value. First of all, once the firm launches in making sure that the investment team isn't distracted, the investment team should be focused on investments and the strategy, and they shouldn't be worrying about anything business related. But the COO should be involved in some of the decisions with regards to the operational setups, whether or not they come in full time, they may come in and be involved with some of the decisions, but they should be involved with the selection of the fund administrator, the selection of the fund auditor. They should be the owner of those relationships, and so they should be part of that decision-making process. And a lot of the decisions around the key operational setup and the key systems that individual should be involved in. So it's important that at least they're involved with those decisions and they're able to provide their input into how that operational framework will work. And in many cases, they've probably worked with many of these service providers. They know, you know what they need and you know the reporting and they have you know they may have developed relationships so it's key to have that person in the door earlier the better what about the trading element side of this there's this area of outsourcing trading what are your views on that piece in the more mainstream strategies having an outsourced trader function makes sense especially if it's not a full-time role there just may not be enough for a full-time person or to hire kind of the senior level of a person that you need. So outsourcing is a great solution there. Or I've also seen it used in the past for certain firms that, you know, it's supplemental, right? So it's the overnight trading where you have a full-time trader that can't be on the desk 24 hours a day where you know, you've supplemented them with an outsourced trading firm that can not only be the backup, but also help with, you know, overnight trading and those types of things. And it's also good for a smaller firm where like day one, they might not have the resources to hire a full-time trader, but over time, you know, as they grow, that might be an option that they, you know, they may eventually bring it in-house. So it's a good, it's a good option from a startup standpoint as well. I'd love to have you walk me through a case study on what one of these onboardings might look like. My very first project I worked on here was with a music royalty manager. When I had first come in, there was a, a team that had been identified, but there was still a lot of work being done on the industry space. And so I was able to dive right in and really start getting up to speed on, first of all, how does this industry work? From an operational advisory standpoint, how can I be effective? And what do I need to know from this particular strategy standpoint? It was, you know, first and foremost, what is it that you actually own? Understanding what is the music royalty copyright? How do these transactions actually work in this industry? The other aspect was following the cash flows. Music royalties produce cash flows back to the copyright holders, and there's a path that they follow through industry intermediaries and back to the ultimate copyright holders. The other aspect was understanding who are the players in this industry, and it was a very different set of players than I had seen across the traditional strategies, both on the service provider side, the fund service provider side, but also one of the key service providers in this space is called a music royalty administrator. And this is a provider that's separate from the fund administrator. It's more of an asset level servicer and they sit in between the copyright holder and collect and account for the various music royalties that are coming in. They they book those cash flows and they pay them back to the copyright holders. 
that was a key role that I needed to understand from how these groups work, the systems that they use, how they account for these things in order to be effective at advising on an operational setup for this particular strategy. Any common deal breakers that you see for emerging managers? Being upfront and open about things is very important for a manager. Investors are looking for long-term relationships and establishing trust and alignment is, is very important. So if there are things that you may not think are ideal, it's always better to be upfront about those things rather than downplay them because eventually the information comes to light. And this goes for established managers as well, where you know I've never seen a 100% perfect manager in any respect and everyone always has their flaws. It's better to recognize those flaws and have a plan for how you're going to remediate that flaw rather than downplaying it or trying to steer the conversation away from it. Communication is key from an alignment standpoint and from a transparency standpoint, right? So the one thing I see managers not do is have that two-way dialogue with investors because investors are very knowledgeable. They see lots of peer managers out there and they can bring a lot to the table. You should tap into that expertise and leverage that. And all you have to do is ask. I was absolutely fine to pick up the phone you know, at Cambridge when somebody was looking and a manager was looking for a new fund administrator or a new service provider and be a sounding board. And again, it'll save a lot of time and effort. And I just don't think managers take as much advantage as, as they could from the value that their investors could bring. What's your perspective on technology as it relates to new technology? I know there's a lot of tools out there to make the process more efficient. The ODE process has always been pretty inefficient. Like all your information is in PDF documents and you need to kind of wade through hundreds of pages of information. And in the old days, in order to figure out what's changed, you had to compare like last year's DDQ to this year's DDQ and go page by page. At Cambridge, we were one of the earliest adopters of these platforms. We brought it on in 2010. The whole thing was to create more efficiency around leveraging the data. There's so much great data we're collecting in PDF DDQs or Word DDQs where you could actually ingest the answers and do peer group analysis, right? So you could kind of look and say like, okay, what OMS do most credit managers use or whatever? You could query and figure out as simple as which one of our managers use Ernst & Young? Like who uses RSN? You know, you could kind of whittle down and then you could do kind of peer group benchmarking, like you said, of who uses what OMS or this system or that system. One of the benchmarks that we created was on the expense, the fund expense side. So we had a pretty good benchmark of expenses by strategy, right? So the average expense ratio for a long-term equity fund for a global, you know, absolute return fund. And then also it helps with monitoring. You could kind of track and compare over time. You could graph out as their staff growth in line with their asset growth. A lot of it was just a key tool to visualize data in order to help with the types of questions that you wanted to ask or probe into. What advice would you give to someone in an ODD role or somebody to look to get into the space? Having exposure to as many different managers and strategies as possible is one, you know, in order to build that backdrop of knowledge, it all comes down to reps. It doesn't have to be direct, you know, ODD reps. One of the things that I still do now is whenever there's an industry blow up or case study, right? So there's been a couple in the last year, there's been some notable issues and frauds. And taking all that information that's made available and unpacking it and learning from it and applying that to the process going forward. Analyzing those cases and asking, would my process have caught this? Or what in my process would have identified this? How can I take this and learn from it going forward and apply it? And unfortunately, 
there's they're almost on a weekly or monthly basis there's a new case study out there where somebody's found some way to fraud investors or you know maybe it's a cybersecurity related instance you know there unfortunately in this world there's lots of very smart people that are looking for new ways to take advantage of other people or steal money or whatnot so it's there's lots of case studies there's another way to get some reps and it's also about learning and doing different things at cambridge we had started looking at crypto back in the early days this is prior to 2018 and there wasn't a lot of information available about crypto certainly not nearly as much as there is today even though it's still a a nascent area but over the last couple years there has been a good amount of white papers and coverage of the industry. But one of the things that I did myself and the individual that we covered crypto with is we went and set up a an account and we have to clear this to make sure that it's okay with your compliance team, but just experience trading crypto on your personal time. So sometimes it's just do it to get exposure. And then it's just getting involved with creating that path to explore new strategies. So there isn't a specific path to get to my particular role. And this role, I'm, I'm the only person that I know of that has this exact role. So it's, it's somewhat unique. But there, you know, those are the types of things that gave me the opportunity to have this opportunity for the role. Well, Gordon, this has been a great conversation. Uh, one of the things we like to do is we'll close with two questions. The first question I have for you is, is what business advice would you give to someone starting a fund? Number one is plan to never plan too much. There's a lot that goes into a launch and being thoughtful about it up front is going to make for a, a smoother launch. And then also it's going to save you from having issues down the road. If you didn't map out your strategic direction of the strategy where down the road you need to change a service provider or unwind a a system and onboard a new system, that's a lot harder to do after launch versus pre-launch. So that's where planning comes into play. And again, one of the other things I had mentioned earlier is have a two-way dialogue with your investors. They bring lots of knowledge and experience to the table and they can provide you with that guidance. They've probably been through this multiple times with other managers and all you have to do is ask. The last question I have it is, what is the one industry book resource that you most commonly send to people? It really varies based on the the strategy. For instance, there are certain managers where they bring a seasoned COO in very early in the process. And my role is a little bit different in that it's less instructive and more of collaborative sounding board process. There's one instance where we had a new launch that brought in a a seasoned COO, CFO that had been involved with five other launches. This individual was very knowledgeable, was very organized, had great ideas of what they wanted to do and how they wanted to bring the framework together. And they knew kind of where they wanted my input. So there's a lot more of a sounding board process versus, you know, here's launching a hedge fund 101. And eventually you get that, you know, person in the door, ideally, but this person was in the door a little bit earlier. So it was a slightly different role. It was great to collaborate and discuss the specifics of certain service providers. And it was a slightly deeper level of collaboration than if you don't have somebody as experienced in that particular seat. We talked about those case studies about where things went wrong and how to learn from them. Is there one place that you go for that? The SEC, (laughs) Securities Exchange Commission, their news releases is a pretty good place to go. A lot of these are documented in your your mainstream media, like the Wall Street Journal. But there is a lot in the, the SEC and their news releases that some of the ones that fly under the radar that aren't as particularly large and impactful that maybe mainstream media doesn't cover or doesn't make the front page. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big 
spectacular fraud. It could just be a compliance issue. So it's it's always good to know the things that the regulators are looking at and what they're focused on. And also the you know the industry service providers I subscribe to and it's all free. You can go to their websites and you know a lot of the the hedge fund law firms, the big four auditors, they put together you know knowledge papers and industry updates and you can sign up for those. Each one has their specific expertise. This month it's that law firm, this next month it's this law firm. On the auditor side, PwC puts out some great materials, but it's really collectively there's these industry service providers put out great content. And then there's industry organizations like AMA and MFA that put out great content as well and may be helpful for emerging managers. They put out best practice guides on, you know, whether it be certain topics on valuation, cybersecurity, or best practices for due diligence a service provider or counterparty. And they're best known for their DDQs. Similar to ILPA on the private side, they have what they've established as the industry standard you know, DDQ on, on hedge funds strategies. Well, Gordon, thanks for your time today. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Scott. I really appreciate it. It was great talking with you. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.